schedules and come um, meet with us here today. I'm Elisa Kaplan. I'm the director of the Action for a Better Tomorrow Illinois-wide organization and also the co-director of the Evanston chapter along with my co-director Dinah Yantaran. Dinah, where are you? I think she's getting extra chairs actually. <laughs> Um, Action for a Better Tomorrow was started after the 2016 election and we have over time matured into a truly grassroots advocacy and educational group. Our goal is to advocate for progressive values at every level of government from the schoolhouse to the White House and this year in particular we've chosen to emphasize statewide issues because we know we have a lot of them and especially with the federal government being the way it is we know how important it is for us to focus on our state government right now. Um, I'd like to thank our very hard working volunteers a lot of people took time out of their schedule to come help us today and I'd also like to thank Grace Lutheran Church which not just today but has so often loaned us their beautiful space for events like this. I'd also like to acknowledge the hard work of everyone involved in organizing this event, including our amazing partners at NOW. Where are you? <laughs> and especially Jen Waldman, the chapter director of Action for a Better Tomorrow's Northern Suburbs chapter, who did a tremendous amount of work to make this happen. She's been really remarkable. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some flyers in the back about Action for a Better Tomorrow and how to join a local chapter. We do have a chapter here in Evanston and obviously we have a chapter in the northern suburbs. We also have several other chapters across the state. So I hope you pick one of those up and I hope that we'll see some of you at a meeting sometime soon. We have just a couple of very brief announcements. So there are two endorsement meetings uh, going on next week, which this forum should be really great to help you make an informed choice in those meetings. Uh, the first one is actually a GOP endorsement meeting for the Northwest Cook County. Um, so that's a candidate forum, on a, I'm not sure exactly who they've invited, an endorsement session. It's at the Copernicus Center at 5216 West Lawrence in Chicago. Um, it's January 20, 20th, so it's Saturday from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. And you can get more information in RSVP for, you, for that online. Um, is there anybody here from that organization that would like to speak to that event? No, okay. Um, we also have another endorsement meeting right here in Evanston for the Democratic Party of Evanston. And I believe we do have... Eamon Kelly over here, who's going to speak very briefly to the logistics of that. Uh, yes, my name is Eamon Kelly. I uh, lead the Democratic Party here in Evanston, and I uh, want to thank NOW and Action for a Better Tomorrow for hosting this great forum. Uh, we had thought about doing our own, and then we learned about the great forum that they were putting together. We've invited our members to come here. And we invite all of you in the room who are Democrats and live here in Evanston to come to our annual endorsement meeting, or our election endorsement meeting, uh, happens every other year, uh, which will be January 21st, next Sunday, at, starting at 4 o'clock at the Unitarian Church on Ridge. And it will go from 4 to 6.30. You'll have an opportunity there. If you're a Democrat, you live in Evanston, you either volunteered with us this past year or you paid your dues. Uh, to become a member there, you can do it online at evanstondems.com. Uh, we also have a little flyer in the back for those of you who are interested. And you can vote on whether or not the Democrats here in Evanston should endorse one of these candidates for Attorney General. Uh, you can also vote on our endorsement for Governor, uh, State Representative in, the, in both in the south part of uh, Evanston and the northwest corner of Evanston, and a number of other important races. So again, I want to thank uh, the sponsors of the event for doing it. Uh, I, I, I want to thank all the candidates for coming up here to Evanston for this great event. And um, I would just like to encourage you to come out next Sunday. And uh, we've got flyers again in the back. Thanks so much. Hello, I'm Catherine Caparuso. I'm president of the North Northwest Suburban Chapter of NOW. And together with the Chicago Chapter of NOW, which stands for the National Organization for Women, if you don't know, um, we are sponsoring this event. Uh, 
We are the oldest and largest grassroots feminist organization in the country, and we do have a chapter that normally meets in Northbrook, but it can move around because our, our um, region basically spans between Barrington and Evanston, so we have a, quite a large area to cover. Um, I'd like to, we do have flyers outside. I'd like to introduce Ronnie Ariola. Veronica Ariola will be moderating, moderating this panel. Um, she is one of my real life uh, feminist superheroes. By day, she uh, works on behalf of diversity and think of students who uh, take science programs and engineering programs at the University of Illinois in Chicago. By night, <laughs> and in her spare time, she's a, a, a amazing activist, she's a writer, she's a blogger, she tweets, which I still really haven't figured out how to do, I apologize about that, but um, just a fantastic, we're very lucky to have her moderating this panel. And without further ado, I'll give it over to you. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Sandra. I'm going to let you slide in next to me. Okay. So Catherine is staffing the slido.com, so keep those questions coming. Keep voting. So, good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me back there in the corner by the 75 years of grace? All right, thank you. Um, first, I want to start off by thanking the audience, everybody coming out. This is an amazing turnout um, to hear from our panel of candidates for the Office of Illinois Attorney General. Um, thank you to all the candidates for being out here so that our voters and residents of Illinois can learn more about you. Um, the organizers have invited all candidates for this office from every party. Um, any candidate who is not in attendance is not a reflection of the planning committee. The framework for this conversation and forum is that I will ask a few prepared questions and each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond. That may be hard for all lawyers, <laughs> but it will be 90 seconds. Um, if not, I will have this card, I will yell, wave like this, time. So, we have a full stage, so please keep your answer at the end, 90 seconds. Um, if a candidate mentions another candidate, you give that candidate 20 extra seconds. And that candidate who's responding does not get to respond. You should not talk about another candidate. Just respond to whatever is asked, mentioned of you. All right? Or my card will be waiting. Again. So again, if all of you who are using Instagram or Twitter, please use the hashtag ILAG Women's Forum. So let's get this party started. Okay. So let's first start off with the, fact, the um, elephant in the room, continuity and change. Lisa Madigan has been our Attorney General for almost 15 years. So this election is an enormous, oh, I'm sorry. Let's, have you all introduce yourselves. <laughs> Go for it. Let's start here. Actually, let's start in the middle. Wow. Do your introductions, and then we'll do this. All right? Sure. Thank you. So you each have two minutes to introduce yourselves. Two minutes. Mike, Mike isn't working. Uh, um, is it mine? Oh, it was working before. I turned it on this switch on the bottom. No? No. My name is Renata Mariotti. I'm running for Attorney General. Um, let me tell you about myself. I was born in Chicago uh, to two parents, uh, neither of whom went to college, and both of whom worked two jobs to put me through school. My dad was a barber during the day, and he delivered papers at night. My mom worked at a local insurance office answering the phones during the day, and then her and my grandma sewed crafts at night. And I would help them take the crafts to the craft shows on the weekend. Um, thanks to their hard work, I was able to go to the University of Chicago, to Yale Law School, and ultimately I was hired by Pat Fitzgerald to become a federal prosecutor here in Chicago. And when I was there, I was there for uh, almost a decade, I'm 41 now, uh, and I, I investigated and prosecuted all sorts of crimes, everything from human trafficking and you know, child exploitation, uh, you know, violent crimes. But what I was best known for and what I focused on most was white collar crime. I was part of the Securities and Commodities Fraud tax Task Force, and I was the first prosecutor in the country to indict and convict a high-frequency trader, which are these people who use the uh, high-speed computers to manipulate the financial markets. 
Um, I took on lots of others as well, people who were real estate developers and, and who even here in Evanston who owned uh, real estate and were taking advantage of the TIF program and others. Um, then I left uh, after, frankly, a, a, a difficult bout with cancer. Uh, I left um, and went to the private sector. And I know that you might be thinking, well, I, I assume you were relaxing at that time uh, after going through so many, I had a bunch of trials and a, and a, and a personal struggle. Um, but then, you know, shortly after that, Donald Trump got elected. And I was involved before that. I was somebody who I considered myself as a, a Democrat and an activist, but I kicked it up into high gear. I was there writing dozens of op-eds in newspapers. I'm on Twitter, on Facebook. A lot of you I, told me beforehand that you, that you, that you were somebody who's read, who reads my work. I'm somebody who uh, is speaking up against the Trump administration. And as AG, I want to take that energy and use it to go after Trump using that platform. Thank you. Well, my name's Pat Quinn. I live in the west side of Chicago and I'm running for Attorney General. Because the Attorney Generals of our country, the various states, are the last line of defense against Trump and his cabinet and their violation of civil rights and all the laws that our country has, it's very important that we take him to court and take them to court when they violate the laws. As Governor of Illinois, I've signed a bill for the Affordable Care Act for our state, and that's under attack by Trump and his allies. It's important that we preserve the right of everyone to have the right of health care decent health care for everyone. And if you have to go to court to protect it, that's what we have to do. And that's what attorney generals do. They're the lawyers for the people. I believe in consumer rights and making sure that everyday people, when they have to confront a utility company or an insurance company or a platform monopoly or a big bank, uh, those institutions aren't taking advantage of individual people. I helped start the Citizen Utility Board 35 years ago, Illinois' largest consumer group still around today. I brought the original envelope from the <laughs> cup way back when. And uh, that's what attorney generals also have to do. They have to organize and summon and band together everyday consumers to make sure we're not taken advantage of by Commonwealth Edison or People's Gas or, or AT&T. Uh, the attorney general has to be the number one consumer advocate in our state and the number one advocate of honesty in government. When I was governor, I signed the bill to strengthen ethics standards in our state, to have campaign finance reform and limits on campaign contributions, to have a strong Freedom of Information Act and a public access counselor for the first time. The Attorney General has to enforce those laws. They have to make sure that everyday people get a fair shake when it comes to honesty in their government. I think it's also important to make sure that you are a people person. If you're a lawyer for the people, you've got to know the people. Think I do. <coughs> One second. Um, if we can refrain from applause so we can keep this okay. show moving. Thank you so much. All right. Good evening. My name is Kwame Raul. I'm a lifelong proud resident of Illinois. I'm a proud child of uh, Haitian immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Applause, please. <laughs> Who immigrated to uh, the United States and met each other in New York, where my father trained to be a physician and then moved to Chicago where he served the South Side for 30 years, never rejecting a patient because of their inability to pay. He would come home with a block of cheese or fruitcake because he believed in healthcare as a human right. That was passed on to me. Uh, uh, 10 days ago, I marked my two year anniversary of my diagnosis for prostate cancer. My access to health care allowed for my early detection and for my treatment that allows me to stand before you as a survivor today. I want that for everybody. Prostate cancer is the third deadliest cancer amongst men. Uh, it's under siege by this Donald Trump who says I come out of an asshole. I don't agree with that. But I'm glad he said it because it lets us know what we're up against. We're under siege and trying to undermine the Affordable Care Act. I sponsored the legislation that Pat Quinn talked about with regards to the Affordable Care Act, with regards to uh, establishing a public access counselor in the Attorney General's office. I sponsored legislation to protect voting rights, both in the redistricting process as well as the constitutional amendment. I sponsored legislation on law enforcement reform before the revelation of a Laquan McDonald video. Also, I 
created a torture inquiry commission to deal with the torture that was happening within the Chicago Police Department. I'm Kwame Raul. I'm not looking for a new job. I'm looking to do, continue to do the work that I've been doing for the last 13 years as a legislator and the last 25 years as an attorney. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Nancy Rotering. Thank you, Now and Action for a Better Tomorrow. My first protest was with Now in 1983. 10 years after Roe v. Wade, keep your laws off my body. I'm not new, <laughs> but I'm delighted to be with you this evening. I'm currently the mayor of Highland Park, and I'm in my seventh year of office. I've done what's expected. I've balanced my budgets. I brought reform and ethics to City Hall. I also banned assault weapons and got sued by the NRA and taken to the United States Supreme Court, and we prevailed. Because of our lawsuit, it's now constitutional to ban these weapons of war in Illinois. I also created a legal aid clinic because I rang doorbells and knew that there was a lot of need in my community, help in the areas of housing, domestic violence, and immigration. We've helped over 400 people in the two and a half years we've been open, and I believe strongly in access to justice. So I share those examples with you because advocacy is my passion. Advocacy is part of the tapestry of who I am, and I believe that this seat provides an opportunity to bring that passion for advocacy, that record of getting things done to the state of Illinois. Um, we're having conversations we never dreamed of. We're watching as our civil rights and our human rights are under attack, the very fundamental rights of our country, and it's important to have an advocate who will stand up to Trump and his detrimental policies. I bring a background in business and in law. I have an MBA and a JD. I also have been a sitting official in an executive position. I've been running the city now for seven years. But most importantly, I bring a record of getting things done, seeing an opportunity to take action, pulling together resources, collaborating, and being the change that we know is necessary. So I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight and really look forward to your support, hopefully, on March 20th. I'm Nancy Rotary. Thank you. <laughs> if anyone has any index cards, if they have questions, please try to find their way, pass them up towards this way, or somebody, oh, yeah, pass, yeah, them, pass them up towards this way, so we can review them while we continue with the introductions. Great. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Jesse Ruiz, and I'm running for Illinois Attorney General because our American dream is under attack, and it's under attack from within. It's under attack by Donald Trump and Bruce Rauner. Working families in Illinois are struggling, and I understand their struggles as the son of Mexican immigrants. My dad came here from Mexico with a third grade education as a migrant farm worker. As part of the Baracero program during World War II, picked crops all over the United States and finally ended up in Mendota, Illinois, where he picked corn. Made his way to Chicago, was undocumented for eight years from 47 to 55, worked all kinds of jobs. I know the Prudential building was built in 55 because that was the last one he worked on. Went back to Mexico got his green card, got his wife, my mother, and, and uh, came back to Chicago and settled in the far south side Roseland community where I grew up. And uh, my mother didn't work outside the home, but she worked as hard as my dad, raising my three sisters and me, and making sure that we knew to always speak out for what is right, to give back to our community. So she worked tirelessly as a volunteer at our church, Little League, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. She embraced this country that embraced her and her family. And because of my parents' hard work and sacrifices, I was able to go on to the University of Illinois, earn my economics degree, and then go on to the University of Chicago Law School, where I had the privilege of having Elena Kagan as my civil procedure professor and Barack Obama as a professor as well, and then become a friend of his and work on all of his campaigns. So I was blessed. I've been able to have a chance at the American dream, but I worry that others may not have that same chance, so that's why I want to be your attorney general. So I can make sure that we fight the affront of our rights by Donald Trump and Bruce Rauner. I want to make sure that we go after unscrupulous lenders who would load up students with burdensome debt on unfair terms. I want to make sure we fight to protect our environment, affordable health care, and women's rights, uh, reproductive rights. And I want to make sure we root out corruption in the state and always ensure that we have open, honest, and transparent government. I want to be your champion. I want to be your advocate. I want to be your Attorney General. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Scott Drury and I'm running for Attorney General to clean up Illinois. Uh, we all know that our state has a problem uh, with corruption. Uh, we have governors in prison, going to prison, coming out of prison, and that, needs, <laughs> and that needs to stop. I'm a former federal prosecutor. I worked under Pat Fitzgerald for seven and a half years, and during that time, I prosecuted public corruption. I prosecuted and convicted a friend and appointee of Governor Blagojevich. I prosecuted and convicted police officers who were doing things that they shouldn't be doing. I have the experience to lead these investigations on day one. I'm not running to be a figurehead. I am running to be an active attorney general to use my credentials, my skills, to make sure that our state every single day is working for you. Because let's face it, at some point, Illinois government became more about the politicians than it did about the people. Uh, after being a, a prosecutor for seven and a half years, I decided that maybe a better way to try to clean up government was to work on the inside. So I ran for state representative in 2012 with no experience. I hung a shingle, I knocked on doors, and I had the privilege, my wife would say sometimes it was the curse of winning. Uh, and uh, every day as a state representative, I have worked for you. In January of this year, I became the first Democrat in 30 years to not vote for Mike Madigan to be the Speaker of the House. Because let's, let's face it, we can talk about Bruce Rauner, and he's got to go, and we can talk about Donald Trump, and he's got to go. But we have to look at why they're in office to begin with. And we have to look inward and say, how can we make sure that Democrats want to vote for Democrats, and how can we make our party stronger? And to do that, we need people who are willing to speak up to the problems within our own party. And that's what I've been doing for the last 12 years, both as a prosecutor and as a state representative. I'm glad that the mayor spoke about the assault weapons bans. It was me who brought her and the other mayors in my community to, uh, to the table and said, we gotta get this done. My name is Scott Drury. I'm running for attorney general to clean up our state once and for all, and it's time we had an attorney general who can work towards that goal. Thank you. Good evening. And I want to say thanks to NOW and ABT for setting this up. Uh, I also had my first political experience with NOW back, I think it was back actually in the 70s though, so I'm dating myself. I'm going to date myself even <laughs> further in a minute. Um, but I'll tell you, I'm running, I'm running for this office because I really believe that the people of Illinois have had it, right? They've had enough, they've had enough of the Trump administration's racist and regressive policies and attack, attacks on our civil rights and well-being. They've had enough of our political leaders' failure to solve the pressing problems that we have leaving our state caught in a seemingly never-ending political flagmire. And they've had enough of our elected officials helping to line the pockets of the corporate and special interests while failing to deliver the economic prosperity and the educational equality that our communities deserve. We need a new kind of leadership. I will bring experienced, principled, and independent leadership to the Office of Attorney General. I have served in the office as an Assistant Attorney General. I've served as a federal prosecutor, also under Patrick Fitzgerald, working on the kinds of cases that are directly relevant to the work of the office, protecting women who are uh, victims of domestic, domestic violence, violent crimes, narcotics and firearms trafficking. And then for the past two years, I've worked in the city in police accountability and police reform. And in that venue, I've proven that I have the capability to hold the powerful accountable. I grew up in the 60s. I was born in the Jim Crow era. I grew up in the 60s. I've seen for whites only signs on six. I was a young <coughs> woman developing my voice in this world in the 70s when the women's rights era was in full swing. I started my professional life in the 1980s when women were still exceedingly rare in various professional endeavors. And I'll tell you, as a woman of color who has spent the last 30 plus years in a male-dominated environment, sure, me too. I've been harassed, but I've also been underpaid, patronized, and marginalized. I know the power of my voice, and I want to use it to fight for the citizens of Illinois. I will fight for you. That's why I'm Sharon Fairley, running for Attorney General. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. When I was in law school, I worked for the Legal Assistance Foundation. And then I worked for the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. What was happening is homeless children were being kicked out of their school because they were homeless. So they would move from homeless shelter to homeless shelter, and they get kicked out of the school. Some kids would, would go to 12 to 15 schools in a school year. That's what I did in law school. I want to take you back to 2000. If we can remember that far away, a lot has happened since then, right? If we could remember back then, the economy was pretty good. I graduated from law school and I applied to one job. 
that was to be a Cook County public defender. It wasn't that popular to represent poor people coming out of law school when the economy was booming. To represent brown and black people who are going through this criminal justice system that's quite frankly not just. That's what I did. And I did that because of a fundamental belief I have in the human dignity of us all. In the fundamental belief that we all have the right to an attorney. Those aren't just some words that are written on a piece of paper. That's a moral contract. And while I was in the public defender's office, I saw the injustice every single day. I also spent some time in private practice representing the NATO protesters, the Occupy Chicago protesters. I stood up for those people who were being mistreated. So what do I want to do as Attorney General? I want to take those same values of being a defender, standing up for people without a voice, standing up for people who don't have that support network. That's what I want to do as Attorney General. It's a bold, progressive agenda. Number one, standing up to the big interests, the big banks, the big corporations and Donald Trump. Number two, having real criminal justice reform, stopping mass incarceration, ending the drug war, and stopping cash bail. And number three, fighting corruption. That's why I'm running for Attorney General. Hope to have your support. Thank you. Thank you. As I set my stopwatch for 90 seconds, one last call for uh, index cards. Um, so, as I was saying earlier, Lisa Madigan has been our Attorney General for almost 15 years. <laughs> Um, so this election is an enormous opportunity for new approaches. Which of the office's priorities and practices would you continue? And which would you change? Particularly when it comes to the protection of rights of women, LGBTQ individuals, people of color, and other vulnerable populations. A reminder your, to limit your answer to 90 seconds. Representative Jury. As Attorney General, Lisa Madigan did a very good job on the consumer protection side. But as Attorney General, I think what the office needs to be do doing, uh, and I will do, is expand it to the public corruption side, the integrity side, to make sure that we're no longer outsourcing public corruption and the watchdog uh, role to the federal government, to the Better Government Association, to the Chicago Tribune, and the Chicago Sun-Times. As Attorney General, I want to make sure that the phrase equal justice for all means, means exactly that. So we're going to make sure that when it comes to protecting women's rights, that we do it in a, an aggressive way. When we see that there's people luring pregnant women, young pregnant women to centers saying that they can get advice on whether or not uh, they, how they can uh, address their pregnancy, that they're not lying to them and showing them videos and encouraging them uh, away from certain options that they have. And we see those ads on the subways all the time. We're going to deal with this parental notification law that Lisa Madigan refused to deal with that says that a child who got pregnant and is scared to tell her parents doesn't have to go to an alley or like we saw in Minnesota end up dead because she's scared to get those rights. We are going to protect everybody that needs to be protected. Minorities, LGBTQ, I have a strong record as a legislator on all of these issues. I was proud to co-sponsor the Marriage Equality Act. I'm a proud co-sponsor of HB 40, which protects Roe v. Wade should, should this Supreme Court change its opinions. And I will continue doing that as your Attorney General each and every day, fighting for everybody in the public. Thank you. We will just go down. Sure. Um, thank you. So I, too, think that Lisa Madigan charted a very positive path forward in terms of protecting citizens' rights and women's in, in particular. But there are a couple of areas that I really want to focus on going forward. The first area is in the area of public safety and, in, and constitutional policing. And it's this area where we see a lot of infringement on the rights of the LGBT community, the disabled community, uh, and also, of course, women. Um, for example, most recently in September, the, uh, the legislature passed a new law that says, look, if there's a police officer that's accused of sexual assault, then an independent agency, someone, an agency that doesn't work for the same agency as the accused officer has to investigate that. But you know what? They left out the Chicago Police Department, the most troubled police department in the country. These are the things that as Attorney General I will work to avoid happening. The other area is in, is in the area of political corruption, and we know we have a problem with this, our legislature when it comes to sexual mis misconduct. It's unconscionable that we went 
three years without a legislative inspector general to investigate and hold those political actors accountable. And I will be more vigilant and I will work to change the law such that that entity actually has the teeth and the power to hold our political leaders accountable when they do, have that, do that kind of misconduct. Attorney General Madigan was competent, her office is competent, but it's cautious. It wasn't bold enough. It didn't stand up enough. So, so on every single issue, we, we talk about Donald Trump, every single day, attorneys general should be out there screaming at the top of their lungs going after this guy. And we see the model throughout the country. Eric Schneiderman in New York and, and the attorney general in Washington and Hawaii who are standing up every single day to Donald Trump. That's number one. We have to be more proactive. The, for, for all this time, the sexual harassment that was going on in the L Illinois legislature, nothing from the Attorney General's office. That's got to stop. And that goes into corruption. That is corrupt. When someone goes to lobby to an to a Illinois legislator and they're being harassed, that's corruption. That's absolute corruption. We have to fight that. So, so what, what Attorney General Madigan's office needed to be, and what I will be, is proactive, being aggressive on these issues, on criminal justice reform. Until uh, up to Laquan McDonald, you heard nothing from that office. They did nothing on criminal justice reform, police accountability, and corruption, as I said, did nothing. And a lot of it, let's just be honest, is her last name. Uh, there had to be some conflict of interest going on there, that she was getting calls about certain things going on in the legislature that she just didn't respond to. Well, I think Lisa Madigan did a very good job as a consumer advocate, and frankly, she leaves a legacy that I think all of us have to try to build on. Uh, from my perspective, uh, what I see in particularly, um, you know, this last year, is, though, is not being in the forefront of the attack against the Trump administration. I'm a member of Indivisible Chicago, like ABT, a progressive organization that is trying to mobilize, and we had to make phone calls to her office to get her to join the ACA uh, suit that the Washington AG brought uh, to make sure that contraceptive coverage continued to be provided under the ACA. Now that's something that we shouldn't have had to be, you know, after her to join. I think that's something we should be in the forefront of. And there are other AGs that are in the forefront of that fight. Um, but for me, I think in terms of my priorities, one of them is, is going to be economic justice, like the problem of wage theft. I mean, we have literally over 50 million claims that have been filed in the state from people like my dad, people who are working, like my dad's a cashier at Walmart, okay? And people like him don't have a lawyer looking out for him. They don't have somebody who can fight for them. They need the attorney general to go and, and move those claims forward so they can get paid. They also need someone now in an era where Trump is shutting down the CFPB, doing whatever possible to have nothing happen there, to have somebody advocating against financial institutions, like I did when I was a federal prosecutor. That's what I'm going to be doing in that role uh, differently than her. Well, I think the against Trump and his hateful, racist policies. It's very important to join with other state attorney generals to take on Trump everywhere. Now, I worked a lot with Lisa Madigan. Uh, we passed the Marriage Equality Act. I signed it into law, historic making law. I signed a number of bills dealing with bullying and harassment. It's very important that we enforce those laws, and that's the job of the Attorney General. I did disagree with Lisa Madigan. She wanted me to veto the bill to end the death penalty. Kwame Raul was a sponsor in the Senate. It was pretty hard to get it up, even called in the House. Uh, but I convinced the Speaker of the House to call the bill, and it passed with the barest of margins. And I signed a law uh, to make sure that we had justice in Illinois. Our death penalty was poorly administered, and we ended it. I think it's important to deal with criminal justice reform. There were people that I gave clemency to when I was governor who were wrongfully convicted. And I think the Attorney General has to be a much stronger voice in that area. I think the Attorney General has to speak out on gun safety. Uh, when the bill was passed, the concealed carry bill, I had a mandatory veto on that bill because I thought it was weak, uh, it didn't protect the public. I thought we should limit high capacity ammunition magazines and assault weapons. Unfortunately, my veto was overridden. But I think it's very important for all people to be safe. And that's the job of the Attorney General, number one. That Lisa Madigan has done as um, Attorney General during the course of this campaign. I think a lot of stones have been thrown at her, and I, I admire the job that she's done. 
particularly on the consumer protection front. I also worked with her to create the public access council in her office, as well as to make sure higher education institutions have a policy against sexual assault on campus. That said, I do think she could have been a stronger voice for criminal, uh, uh, criminal justice reform. And the other front that I'd be, that's quite personal to me because I've had to come home to my kids after there was gunfire in front of our home on multiple occasions. And the trauma that that causes uh, to kids and to people at large, there has to be resources directed to deal with that trauma. That's why I sponsored legislation to create trauma recovery centers uh, in communities of high violence. I traveled to visit to one of those trauma recovery centers in San Francisco. And what we saw, particularly with, with, with women who were victims of rape, that when you first start dealing with somebody as a victim, instead of a complaining witness, you're able to deal with the crime better. Law enforcement panels testified before us. What happens too much is you start in interviewing somebody as a witness instead of realizing that they've gone through a trauma. The kids that are in neighborhoods of high violence have also gone through that trauma. So I'll add my voice to those who support the job that Lisa Madigan has done and, and look forward to building on her legacy in the areas of consumer protection, environmental protection, um, and more so what she's done in terms of victims' rights advocacy, helping immigrants, and Workplace uh, Safety Bureau. Those are areas, I believe the question was women's rights and impacting women. And so we know that in the areas of victim rights, unfortunately women far too often are the recipients of criminal acts and in need of additional support services. That's an area that I would absolutely focus on to continue her work in terms of providing resources for sexual assault nurse examiners, protecting witnesses before the court hearing, during the court hearing, after the court hearing, because they are not only survivors of crime, but they then are potential victims again because of those hearings. Working with our immigrant communities, because so many of the people who are undocumented are women and families who are also subject to domestic violence and afraid to call the police for fear out of being deported or losing their family support. Workplaces, obviously women are at risk. As Sharon noted, the two of us have certainly had our share of harassment coming of age in the 80s and the 90s and working in male-dominated industries. But women need to know that they have an advocate who will stand up for them, who will talk about sexual harassment and fix the laws that currently exempt certain employers, provide opportunities for a hotline, and also take on serial predators, something that currently isn't viewed to be a crime but should be akin to something like stalking laws. Likewise, I agree that I believe Lisa's done a great job when the time she served with the resources that she's had. The times change. She's, uh, we have a new president, unfortunately, and, and so uh, we need to step it up against that, that president and make sure we protect our rights that he's constantly seeking to affront. Uh, we also need to make sure we build the capacity of the office. There are more that has to be done. There's going to be overseeing consent decree. So when I came back from Champaign, moved back to Roseland, I, I joined the Community Alliance for Neighborhood Safety and tried to bring back in 1990, 1992, community policing first to Chicago. CAPS didn't quite get it. And we have to work on that reform efforts. We'll have the consent decree. That'll be a, a new vehicle to do that. But it's going to be a new line of work. You know, Lisa was working on uh, the methamphetamines, was the big crisis she was trying to work on back then. That's now transitioned into opioids. We're going to have to work on that. And then make sure we, we continue to enforce uh, a rather uh, resource the Violence Against Women's Unit that's in the office, making sure we expand those that, that capacity. I was talking to a pastor on the northwest side of Chicago, something that's not getting a lot uh, in the news, but she was telling me about all the young women she sees who are being trafficked. I mean, it, it, it's something that's just frankly disgusting. And, and she's is asking me, as the future Attorney General, will you help me and help these young women who are being trafficked? It doesn't get enough attention, and I intend to do so and help her. Thank you. As some of you have already mentioned, we have an issue with domestic violence and <coughs> guns in the state. Gun violence against women in America is inextricably linked to domestic violence. 
Women are 16 times more likely to be killed with guns in the U.S. than in any other country, in every, any other developed country. And every town analysis of every mass shooting between 2009 and 16 have also found that 54% were committed by intimate partners or family members. Given the data on women being murdered by intimate partners who use guns, and uh, how will your administration work to keep women of Illinois safe from gun violence? Mr. Ruiz. Oh. <laughs> Following on what I said, the uh, Violence Against Women Unit, making sure that that, because that is true, that is a statistic, we're working hand in hand with the you know, consent decree in Chicago and elsewhere, you know, bring about licensing of gun shops. There's way too many illegal guns in our city, and so we have to make sure we can do all we can within the constraints of the Second Amendment to make sure we put those gun manufacturers in check with the gun shops. You know, if you have Chucks in the south suburbs of Chicago, that most of the guns that they're selling, or a good proportion of those are selling, end up used in crime. So obviously, straw purchasers are buying those guns, making sure we step up and work with the federal government to go after these gun shops, make sure that folks don't have, especially because now you have states like Wisconsin, who pretty much at birth, you can get a FOID card in Wisconsin, and, and infants can now supposedly buy guns. They're being bought by their parents, or typically their dad, Who's, who may have been involved in prior violence against somebody, typically their partner, and they shouldn't own the gun. So we're surrounded by these areas where guns are coming into our state. We can't impact their laws, but we can make sure we have good laws here to make sure that those guns aren't getting in the hands of either partners or spouses, folks who shouldn't be using those guns, and then reinforce that unit. Use some of the proceeds we're getting from the office in other matters of suing big corporations on the consumer side or on the environmental side, making sure we use those resources to shore up the capacity of the office, particularly this, this violence against women's unit. We're assuming we're going to Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, so as I mentioned earlier on, uh, I'm the mayor of a city that banned assault weapons and large capacity magazines, and you all have that constitutional right thanks to the lawsuit that took us to the U.S. Supreme Court. But you're sitting here going, why haven't we had this conversation? And the reason why is because the Illinois General Assembly has not yet changed the law that only gave you a 10-day window. I wrote letters to the members of the Illinois General Assembly. I will be that advocate as the Attorney General. Last month when I wrote to them, I was just Nancy the Mayor. I didn't get an answer back from a single one of them. As Attorney General, I will make this a priority and we will talk about why we need to move forward and allow our cities to have this conversation. Similar in action by the Illinois General Assembly when it came to gun dealer licensing. They had that opportunity a month ago and the comment made by a number of them was, don't bring it to a vote, we don't want to be primary. They were more concerned about saving their jobs than saving lives. Again, as Attorney General, I will make this a priority. Access to legal services is critical to people who are facing domestic violence. And especially if you're not documented, you're going to have an even harder time getting that representation. As I mentioned, I already created a legal aid clinic and would love to see those in other cities providing access to justice for anybody, regardless of their documentation status, regardless of their income. Because if you're at risk of losing your life, you need to have access to an attorney to put up those protections. As a member of the Illinois General Assembly, I was happy to uh, be chair of the committee where we moved gun dealer licensing out of uh, the committee. And uh, I was happy to argue on the floor of the Senate where we voted gun dealer licensing out of the Senate. Uh, I can only act in one chamber. Uh, <laughs> but I also worked with the Illinois, I worked on that with the Illinois Council Against Handgun Violence. I also worked with the Illinois Council Against Handgun Violence to make sure we had, for the first time, reporting of lost and stolen weapons, as well as background checks on private transfer of guns. It used to be that uh, when you get your FOID card revoked, let's say if you were a perpetrator of domestic violence or some other felony, uh, oftentimes those cards were not being retrieved. So somebody could present themselves as a valid buyer of a gun, but there was nothing in the law that required the person that was transferring the gun to check to make sure that card was still valid. I passed a law, the governor signed it, uh, to make sure that that was a requirement. As Attorney General, I will advocate to have a little bit more teeth in that law, and I'll, I would also work with local law enforcement to make sure that we're going out to some of these people who have cards 
that are active for a number of years, uh, that we work to retrieve the guns from them. When it comes to survivors of domestic violence, uh, I work quite a bit with uh, organizations that help survivors, providing housing and safe housing, and making sure that the perpetrators did not find out where those survivors are, and make sure that those uh, perpetrators did not have access to weapons. As just mentioned by Senator Raul, we passed bills that I signed. There were bills that I uh, wanted to get signed, uh, dealing with high capacity ammunition magazines, as well as uh, assault weapons. Uh, I veto uh, the effort by the General Assembly to take that pr uh, right away from local governments uh, to do what they did in Highland Park uh, and a few other towns. They only gave 10 days uh, to do this important reform. I thought that was just plain wrong. I'm not a very popular guy with the NRA. I was their number one target in 2014, and I'm willing to take them on in 2018. You've got to be a strong voice for gun safety uh, to make sure that people are protected. I think that's a very important role of the Attorney General. Frankly, I think the Attorney General has to be very, very vocal in working with other Attorney Generals around the country to go after gun manufacturers. Oftentimes, what happened in Newtown and other places, uh, those were perpetrated with weapons that should have never been in the hands of the killers. And I think it's important to go after those gun manufacturers as Attorney General, and I look forward to doing that. We've been hearing a lot about laws that have been passed, and I think we keep seeing the laws get passed down in Springfield, but women still get victimized throughout the state. You know, I know when I was a federal prosecutor, I investigated crimes where women were being trafficked, when women were being victimized, and you know, what, what struck me, particularly when it came to violent crime, we're talking about handguns here, and this question is, how little information sharing there is amongst law enforcement. You know, when we talked um, earlier when I was giving my intro about all these financial crimes that I prosecuted. On that side of things, there's this amazing information sharing uh, that goes on. After 9-11, there's all these reports that banks are filing and, and telling each other about, about things and letting law enforcement know what's going on. That does not happen on the domestic uh, violence side and on the gun side. You know, we, we just saw recently, unfortunately, a shooting that occurred uh, very tragically when a man had committed sexual, um, or excuse me, uh, domestic violence and then obviously killed uh, his partner uh, later on. You know, we have to have more information sharing, but I also think we need to set a better example. And, and you know, this is why somebody who isn't a politician, hasn't been elected, you know, looking at what was happening in our General Assembly where we had women being sexually assaulted down in Springfield and there was no uh, Inspector General down there, um, that was awful. It was disgraceful where we literally, you know, had people coming to petition their government and being assaulted. That's the sort of thing that I think you know, um, she demonstrates a last, lack of respect for women and ultimately hurts uh, victims. As Attorney General, I will make sure that uh, perpetrators of domestic violence are not getting handguns or any guns, any weapons whatsoever. So we have to make sure that that is happening because we see while there's laws preventing it, uh, there isn't enough in the execution of these laws and enforcement of these laws. I want to thank the governor for agreeing with me, which is what I've been saying on the campaign trail since day one. Right after the Las Vegas shooting, Moms Demand Action was out in front of uh, downtown, and they had a huge rally, and I spoke. Everyone's talking about bum stocks and banning assault weapons. That's great. We need to go after the gun manufacturers. They are putting in tools of death into our communities with no accountability. The Attorney General has the ability to take them to court. Just like tobacco litigation, we can actually go after them. And I don't care if we win or lose or not, we're gonna depose them and find out exactly what it is they're doing. What are they doing? They know exactly what it is. They are trying to get people to, to go on a mission. In fact, you can see some of these advertisements from some of these uh, gun manufacturer companies. Make it your mission to have one of these assault rifles. That's what they do. They know exactly what they're doing. They're getting people with these mental illnesses to take that gun and follow in on their mission. We can sue them. So the City of Chicago Civilian Office of Police Accountability had jurisdiction over complaints in which police officers were alleged to have committed domestic violence, but also in which police officers were alleged to have not investigated the issues of incidents of domestic violence properly. And so I have experience working these kinds of cases, and it requires 
of expertise and, and training to make sure that these things are done. One possibility is that this is a potential source for, for a pattern and practice investigation. For example, if the law enforcement agency has a lot of allegations where they're not serving women well, that's something that the Attorney General can go in and, and conduct a pattern and practice investigation. We're probably, but the gun issue is very complicated, right? There is just not one solution. And so we have to work around, we have to put sort of surround the issue on a 360 degree basis. In my view, it requires not only looking at strengthening laws, also strengthening enforcement, and then also community engagement on the issues. When you talk about strengthening laws, we have to keep the pressure up both on the state basis and on a federal basis. So we definitely need to push through the gun dealer licensing law, and we've got to get some legislation statewide against assault weapons. We also need to, on the federal, we need to keep the pressure up on the federal level because we're surrounded by states where guns are coming from. As a federal prosecutor, I investigated a ring that we had guns coming from Ohio into Chicago where they sold the guns and bought heroin and took it back, and it was this vicious cycle. So it's, it's, it's going to be a, a surrounding approach with laws, better enforcement, and then community engagement. Yesterday I met with and spoke with an individual from Evanston. His name is Alan Scott. Uh, his daughter, uh, he lived, his daughter uh, was murdered two years ago. Uh, she was in Englewood. And I met with him uh, to, he wanted to hear about my platform for ending gun violence. And his question to me was a fair one. He said, Scott, can anything be done? Do you really think anything can be done? And I said to him, it can't be done, we can't fix this problem until politicians stop talking and start taking action. We need people with spines. We need people who are going to stand up to the NRA. We need people that when they pass this 10-day law, they go around and we get in my whole community, Highland Park, Highwood, North Chicago, Deerfield, they pass assault weapons bans and regulations because we took action. We need people to call people out when they're talking about their records on guns. When Senator Arul is a single person, whenever you see that, that a sign that says no guns here, he negotiated the concealed carry bill. But yet he talks about all these things that he did to help you. All right, we got to call people out on this, all right? It's not a joke. I'm the co-sponsor of the Lethal Violence Order of Protection, which is a very specific issue we're talking about. If someone is domestically abused and concerned about the fact that their spouse might have a gun and may injure them, they can go to court and get a gun. Or, I'm sorry. They can, go, I wish they, could. they can go to court and make sure those guns are taken away. But Democrats are fighting these bills. We ran a bump stock bill to ban bump stocks got 37 votes out of 67 people in the general, 67 Democrats in the general assembly. 37. Where were the other Democrats? We need people with spines to stand up to end this problem, not just talk about it. Right. You will have your 20 seconds. I will let the microphone get to you and go. I got a spine because I have to go home to a neighborhood and deal with my kids having to deal with the gun violence in my neighborhood. I have a spine. That's why the Illinois Council of Handgun Violence gave me the Lincoln Award in the very year you're talking about. That's why my campaign manager just came off of a campaign for every town in, in Nevada. This is an important issue to me, and I have a spine. All right, we'll start with Charlie. Next question. Uh, what can and will you do to protect Illinois voting systems from hacking and our voting rights in general? <laughs> this is such a this is such a this is such a core issue, right? This this gets to the core of our democracy, our ability to protect our voting rights. The first thing is we need to work on making sure that we're working on uh, the proper redistricting because that's one of the ways in which our voting rights are infringed. Second thing I'd like to do is to, to do an audit, essentially, of the legal and structural systems that are in place to protect, to physically and technologically protect the voting systems that we have in place, and then make sure that we uh, uh, amend the laws and address the technical impediments to safety for our, for, our voting, for our voting rights. And then the third thing is we need to push back against any infringement of our civil rights to vote. We had a good win a couple weeks ago when President Trump finally agreed to back off on his, his voting commission, which was really just a joke. But we have to be vigilant to make sure that there aren't any further other attempts to attack our right to exercise our right to vote like that. So it's about being vigilant and then pushing back with all the power of the office, whether it's lawsuits or, or just having the strength to stand up and advocate for the right system to put in place.
Well, the first thing we need to do, and, and this pretty much applies to every single question that's being asked, and that's to, to stop Trump every, everything he does. Uh, <laughs> if he sneezes, we need to stand up and, and do something. Because the man is fascism. The, the man is chaos. And, and that's what he's trying to do with our electoral systems. He's trying to basically allow uh, for the Russians uh, to hack in uh, to our voter files. And, and, and that's just unacceptable. And the Attorney General needs to stand up and fight that every single way. And we, we had a success there. Uh, but we also need to look in voting rights in many, many different ways. Uh, we do have a lot of good voter protection laws in the state of Illinois. But there's a lot of things that we don't look at. For example, why, why are we voting in the coldest uh, months of the year? Uh, it, it, it makes no sense. Uh, we, we need to advocate for, for complete voter accessibility so, so that actually it's encouraged to vote. Uh, you know, so a lot of these legislators, a lot of these politicians, they like the press turnout uh, because that helps them. Their base gets them in office and they keep them in office. So we need to encourage people to vote. So I'm the committeeman of the 33rd Ward that's on the northwest side. There's a guy by the name of Dick Mel. And this is typical machine politics. They suppress the vote by making you uninterested. We have to encourage the vote to make you interested. Well, I think the original question was about protecting our voting, voting systems from attack. And this is an issue I've talked a lot about and have been doing for many, talking about for many, many months because the Russian government attacked our voting systems here in Illinois. The Department of Homeland Security issued a report saying 21 states had their voting systems attacked. Our state was one of them. There are some people who have been talking about that, but not enough. Uh, Mike Quigley's talked about that, David Orr, but we have not done a full investigation here in Illinois of what happened uh, to our voting systems. And we need, and that's what I'm gonna do as Attorney General. I'm gonna conduct a full investigation. I'm gonna issue a report of my findings, and I'm gonna issue recommendations to make sure we're prepared for the next attack. Because after speaking to experts about this, this was a probing attack. Uh, it was not, you know, it was just a precursor for more attacks to come. And if we're not prepared, they could do some real damage to our systems next time. And I want to make sure everyone can feel confident that their vote counts. It's the most important thing in our democracy. And if people think that their vote doesn't count or that it's going to get manipulated in some way, that's going to depress turnout. It's an important part of voting rights. We have to stop all of Trump's efforts to, to depress the vote, voting rights. And I agree that you know, I've been very vocal on the movement to end cross-check and to get us out of cross-check with uh, Indivisible Chicago. I've been working in a, in a, a spokesman on that, on that issue. But there's, but there's more, to, more to come. And I think protecting our voting systems is an important piece of that. For Illinois voting uh, districts to have an audit of their electronic systems a paper audit. They have this in Oregon. We don't have it in Illinois. And there's great danger that it's tampering with the election results, whether it's by the Russians or someone else. I think that's a very important issue. I think also, uh, I signed the bill for online voter registration. Then I signed the bill for allowing for registration on election day. I think we want to encourage as many people to register and vote. And one of the most important ways to do that is to do what they have in Missouri and Ohio and Michigan and many other states across the country. Allow citizens to vote on issues as well as candidates. It's called the initiative and referendum process. And I think we need that. We've heard today about the importance of gun safety. The people are way ahead of the legislature when it comes to demanding reform and gun safety. We also need to raise the minimum wage. The people want to raise the minimum wage. They even voted for it in Arizona but we only have advisory referendum in Illinois. If we're going to get strong ethics standards that the people want, the voters want, the taxpayers want, the only way to really do that is to give the people the right to vote on ethical reforms to the General Assembly, statewide officials, local officials. So the best way to really expand voting rights is to always protect the system, but also give voters the right to vote on issues they care about by petitioning them onto the ballot. Um voting machines and, and security in general. Uh, first off, I, uh, I'm not going to wait till I'm Attorney General. I've already been working with Indivisible. Uh, I, we drafted legislation to get us out of the cross check, to, to, just to mandate that State Board of Education, Board of Elections does not participate in cross check. And additionally, me and 13 of my colleagues a week and a half ago wrote a letter to the State Board of Elections uh, asking them what they're going to do. They responded with a letter saying that since they, they haven't been uh, given 
uh, uh, communication that voters' information can be secure, they won't be participating. But I, I don't trust that, so we're going to go on with our, uh, with our legislation. Finally, I'm working on legislation to model after what Kamala Harris uh, did in California to make sure that the machines that we're utilizing uh, have come up to certain security standards. So uh, that's to reply to the exact question that was asked. To protect our voting rights is to protect our democracy. It absolutely has to be a priority of this office to take action, to join with other state attorneys general, and to work together to prevent this attack on our democracy. Um, but let's also talk about voting rights and the impact on women because of the way that our current system works. Women are disproportionately uh, obstructed from getting to the polls. More women have hourly jobs. More women are responsible for childcare. It's harder for us to get to the polls in the way that it's currently constructed. And as early voting is diminished, we lose our flexibility and our ability to get to the polls because of those very limitations that are still endemic in our culture. So let's talk about making it more accessible to women in terms of how it actually is working. I also issued a statement against cross-check. I'm, ha I'm hopeful that we can move forward, but at this point it absolutely has to be a priority both in terms of the cybersecurity piece, but also the logistical piece and the current obstacles that exist in terms of getting women to the polls. Batting cleanup with my colleagues is great because I get to crib off of a lot and agree with a lot of what they said. Yes, we have to protect the technology of the systems. Uh, and yes, we have to protect uh, the integrity of, of our voting systems. But we also, frankly, have to learn a lot from all those S-hole countries uh, because they vote on Sundays. They stand in line for five hours at a time to exercise their right to vote. They don't sell alcohol on the day they vote, at least in Mexico, where my parents got from forbidden 24 hours in advance. I don't want anybody drinking when you go to the polls. It's a serious obligation. Uh, and so uh, I hope we take some lessons from those countries and make sure that let's be vigilant that uh, that that voting commission you know where the where that power and authority went when it was in Spanish, right to ice so uh, the the uh, the window dressing of just getting rid of it does not get rid of the motive of suppressing you know the the vote amongst minorities and communities of color and so I will make sure we stand up to Donald Trump because of that motive of making sure we don't dis disenfranchise communities of color and let's learn from some of our asshole neighbors to make sure we all get 70, 80 percent voter turnout and do it in reasonable times of year and on reasonable days where we want and encourage people to vote. I, I agree with a lot of what's been said about cross-check and certainly we don't want to be participating in that program. But we have to look at what's going on right here in Illinois apart from Trump, what our own party has done to make sure that only certain people get to vote and only certain people vote in these primaries, right? When you go to the ballot box on March 20th, they're going to ask you, declare a party. Are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Are you an Independent? A lot of people don't show up because they don't want that data point on them. I've introduced legislation for five years now that says let's get rid of these partisan primaries and have an open primary. You can go and you can vote for whoever you want and no one keeps the data on you. I was really pleased when I first got into office, Governor Quinn came and he said, I want, to I, want to, I want to champion that bill for you. And so I thought, wow, this is cool. I've been here all the two days. I'm working with the governor. And he did a press release that he was for it. Never heard from him again. And when I went to talk to his office, they're like, well, you know, sorry, it didn't work out. The other thing that we need to do to make sure that we have fair elections in this state is that we have fair maps. We have fair maps. When in, in elections in this state, there's only like 12 districts out of 118 where there's even a competition. There's even a competition. We have de facto kings and queens. They know they will never be kicked out of office. There are people who tried to petition to get it on the ballot, and the Supreme Court said that they weren't allowed to do that. I've introduced legislation every single year I've been in office to end that too, because the number one thing we can do to fix Illinois government is to have competitive elections. That will get people out to vote, and that will change our state once and for all. Governor, you have 20 seconds to respond. <laughs> if, you, if you wish. Well, as I said earlier, if we had the power of referendum in Illinois where people could put independent maps on the ballot, the Supreme Court 
rule it off the ballot because we have a very limited initiative power in this state. I believe we should broaden that power to allow redistricting to be a subject that people can vote on, redistricting reform. In the area of open primary, where you don't have to declare your party, uh, I strongly believe in that. I filed a lawsuit against that some years ago, and I think that the referendum power, if we could put open primary on the ballot, would pass overwhelmingly. Thank so you, maybe Governor. we could work on that with uh, Representative Drew. Could have worked on it. Yeah. Yeah. many of the Chicago Police Department practices and was about to form an agreement with the Police Department to institute reforms, but the new administration has made it clear that it has no interest in following through with this original plan. WBEZ and the Better Government Association has just released a report on how under-investigated police shootings are in the suburbs. As Attorney General, what can you do to ensure that CPD and other police departments across the state respect Illinois citizens' civil rights? Re yeah. Residents' civil rights. Thank yes, thank you. In fact, that report came out a year ago yesterday. Uh, was the one year anniversary of that report coming out of the uh, Obama Justice Department Office of Civil Rights had a myriad of recommendations, and uh, that's what, you know, the Sessions Justice Department was going to do nothing. Lisa Madigan picked up the baton, filed suit against the city of Chicago, and it will result in a consent decree that will be ongoing for years. I'm sure it will be. Most likely the next several attorneys <coughs> general and I will be able to work on that and help make sure that we transform law enforcement, not only in Chicago, but that series uh, was shocking, and I listened to a lot of it. Uh, you know, the, 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 there was a police start, uh, superintendent in the south suburbs of Chicago who thought, yeah, this is crazy. We didn't investigate the shooting, uh, and a person was, was uh, shot, shot somebody five different times, was promoted to a sergeant. And this is the chief of this department who's saying he's shocked and nobody looked at it, like when it was his job to look at it. And so, uh, you know, we need to overse oversee some of those operations, include suburban police departments, make sure the training, licensing, uh, pr continuing professional education of police officers. That's why, you know, as a, as a young guy in my 20s, I worked on bringing community policing to Chicago because I saw back then in my Roseland community, we needed to transform that relationship and make sure that, yes, those officers who serve with integrity and serve and protect us and put their lives online every day are supported, but that we need to change the culture around that so they can flourish. At the end of the day, the priority of government is maintaining the public safety. And so this is a vital and important role for the Attorney General. As you may recall, I am a mayor, so I have some experience in dealing with police departments, and granted, they're different across our state. But that being said, every one of them has the following in common. They need to have resources. They need to have metrics for measuring whether they're doing their job well and fairly and safely. They need to have accountability. And they need to also have the resources necessary because being a police officer is a tough job and you need to have the mental health services for yourself that are also necessary for the very people that you're policing. We need to make sure that human rights are absolutely protected in the provision of public safety, and that's why community policing really is the way to go. So you need to have the voices of those for whom you're providing those services included in that conversation, included in that discussion of how do we best meet the needs of the community. How do we address the fact that that house has a domestic violence repeat offender? How do we address that that house has guns? How do we address that that house has mental health issues or addiction issues? And take all of those into account. There's accreditation of police services, and in a lot of the, the departments that were discussed, they weren't accredited. They didn't have the resources. This has to be a priority, and with collaboration with the Attorney General's office, and state's attorneys and the police chiefs of Illinois, we can move forward, provide public safety, but also maintain human rights. Thank you. Well, Representative L.G. Sims and I uh, collaborated with the Attorney General's Office and others to uh, pass a law enforcement reform package uh, prior to the revelation of the Reform McDonald video that the Obama administration's uh, commission uh, complemented as a, a, a model. Uh, however, uh, it fell short in my uh, view, notwithstanding the fact that I was a sponsor. Uh, 
Uh, there's one, actually, I, I prided myself on working bipartisan. There's one uh, Republican senator who's a former sheriff who's uh, repeatedly sponsored a bill for police licensing. Uh, we have certification for officers now. However, the only way that certification can be removed is, 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 is if they're convicted of a felony. A lot of the offenses that they uh, commit uh, may oftentimes be difficult to prosecute. However, myself as a lawyer, others in other professions, uh, if somebody has a complaint about me, they can go to the ARDC and have my license pulled and I will not be able to practice as a lawyer. We should have the same standard for those who carry deadly force. Uh, my very first case, uh, my office was right here in Evanston, uh, coming out of the state's attorney's office, was one where I represented somebody in the south suburbs who had been put on a chokehold until he was uncon unconscious and woken up with a stun gun. Office is the key office to make sure that we have reform with respect to police conduct. Uh, obviously, the Consent decree in the city of Chicago, our largest city, is exceptionally important. That consent decree, as you will hear from Sharon Fairley and others on this panel, uh, has to include important things like uh, the recruitment of police officers, their training, their supervision. It's very, very important that it be a strong consent decree that is enforced uh, by the Attorney General. And perhaps having learned about what WBZ investigated, uh, there may need to be other police departments in Illinois that are subject to the same kind of uh, oversight and consent decree. Now, I, as governor, uh, dealt with clemency, uh, almost 5,000. I granted quite a few of them. In reading these cases, unfortunately, there was wrongdoing. People were wrongfully convicted in some cases. My very last day as governor, I pardoned a man who was wrongfully convicted. He was in prison for 22 and a half years for a murder he didn't commit. When you read about that file, you see there was misconduct by law enforcement. Uh, there are exemplary law enforcement officers, and I went to their funerals, and I know firsthand the great job they do. Uh, but I think it's very important that their model be the only way police officers act, act in our state in any way, shape, or form. The WBZ report that you talked about a moment ago and that you asked us about, what it talked about was a pattern in suburban police departments where there would be a shooting that was very questionable under questionable circumstances, there wouldn't be a sufficient investigation or sometimes any investigation at all, and often no consequences at all for an officer. And I'll tell you, from my experience investigating police officers, it's often very difficult to generate indictments and convictions against police officers. And so I think, you know, there's really a two ways to approach that problem. One is for the Attorney General's office to do what happened in Chicago, which is bring suit and bring and file and try to seek consent decrees where there are departments, not just in Chicago, but elsewhere, that have problems that are systemic to that, to that office and that department. But beyond that, I think what we need to do when there are shootings is conduct investigations and issue public findings and issue a public report and recommendations where there is no potential criminal violation so that we can shine light on what happened because communities deserve to know what happened. They need to rebuild their relationship with the police and we have to make sure that citizens can hold the department accountable to make sure they change so there aren't those problems in the future. That's what we need more of, not just with this problem, but many other problems in the state of Illinois. Because frankly, you know, yes, there's been a lot done uh, down in Springfield, but it just has not gotten the job done, and it's not getting the job done in local police departments either. Many criminal defense attorneys are also civil rights attorneys, and they become civil rights attorneys because they see the injustice in the criminal justice system. So I mentioned I represented individuals in the NATO protest. I represented someone specifically who was just protesting. They were walking down the, the sidewalk on Michigan Avenue over the bridge, and a sergeant turned around and punched my client right in the face. Now, that's bad enough, right? But it got even worse. He was then charged with aggravated battery to a police officer, claimed, according to the sergeant, that my client punched him in the face. Well, thankfully, and this doesn't always happen, there was helicopters and media, and there were professional photographers all over the place. They, the prosecutor insisted on going forward and prosecuting this young man, even though we actually had a, a still footage of a fist right in my client's nose. And the sergeant got up there repeatedly and lied. So as a criminal defense attorney, I see it. 
I see the transition from criminal defense to civil rights. I represented individuals and their families who were shot and murdered by the police in some of these same uh, suburban uh, municipalities. It's really gotten out of hand. So what do we need? We need a consent decree, and hopefully that will, that will come. But we need more. Okay, Lisa Madigan is filing suit with Rahm Emanuel. We need to be very skeptical of that. We need the community involved. The community needs the ability to go into court and enforce the consent decree. And that's what I'll do as Attorney General. So, uh, as the Chief Administrator of the Independent Police Review Authority and then the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, the new agency, I, I've spent the last two years uh, spending a lot of time thinking about police reform and police accountability issues. So I have a very strong view about what needs to change within the Chicago Police Department. And so I look forward to working on the consent decree and then enforcing the consent decree. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to get done with the Chicago Police Department. But looking more broadly from a state perspective, there are a number of issues that I'd like to, it, initiatives that I'd like to put in place. First is dealing with the law and policies that govern the use of force. The Supreme Court precedent that governs the use of force is a very low standard, so I would like to impanel a statewide task force to come up with a statewide best practice policy for the use of force that can be promulgated in the, in this, in the law enforcement agencies across the state. I would also look to recommend a annual training program for officers. Right now, there's law that governs what training officers get before they start. I would like to suggest that they need training every year on use of force and de-escalation and other topics on skills that need to be refreshed every year. I would like to recommend also a change to the certification process. Right now, officers can lose their, their state certification if they have committed a felony. I would, I would like to expand that to include if they've been convicted or proven in a court to have con committed a, an excessive force incident or, or lying. Uh, so there's a series of reforms that I'm going to be recommending. It's easy to jump on the bandwagon once an issue is popular. The, the question of, of leadership is who takes on an issue before people care about it. When I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I had a prosecute police officer who was caught on tape long before the Quan McDonald. There was an individual who was uh, handcuffed to a wheelchair and passed out, and then the police officer started beating him up with something called a leather sap. It was caught on a hospital videotape. Cook County State's Attorney gave him a slap on the wrist. We brought federal civil rights actions and convicted that officer. Not only did he do that, but he lied on the police report and talked about how this individual was about to attack him, not knowing it was on tape. In 2013, when I got into the General Assembly, my number one issue was ending wrongful convictions in the state of Illinois. And we passed groundbreaking legislation, first in the nation legislation, to change the way eyewitness identifications work. At that time, again, Cook County State's Attorney, very popular. Chicago Police Department, very popular. And I'm proud of that work uh, because I did it not because it was popular, not because it was in the news, because it was the right thing to do. And now uh, I've earned the endorsement of Rob Warden. He's the founder of the Center on Wrongful Convictions and the endorsement of Tom Sullivan, uh, the former U.S. attorney here in Chicago. Uh, and he uh, headed up the uh, task force to, uh, to end the death penalty. And they've seen my advocacy in this area of police reform. And they saw that I took on these tough issues before anybody was talking about them. And they put their support behind this because they know that I'm going to take on these issues even when they're not popular. I'm going to take them on because they're right. Thank you. So for our last question, very popular question from the audience is, and we're going to actually start with Freeman Goldstein. Uh, for the panel, what is your position on the legalization or decriminalization of marijuana? How should Illinois respond to the recent federal moves to restrict marijuana options? And what is your position on people currently serving sentences on marijuana charges? So, 90 seconds. Legalize it. <laughs> uh, don't decriminalize. Don't go halfway. Don't investigate it. The data is clear. This has been a, a let's call it a, well, it's a drug, if you, if you even want to call it that. It's been used for centuries. We know the medicinal effects and impacts that marijuana has. And what we know is that this is one of the worst domestic policies we've seen in the last 50 years, the drug war. It's absolutely ridiculous that we are throwing people in jail because they smoke weed. People drink alcohol, people smoke cigarettes, and we're throwing people in jail for a product that arguably, not arguably, is safer 
and more of a benefit than those two items. What did prohibition do? There's one thing prohibition did, that was the prohibition of alcohol. It created the mafia. When we criminalize drugs, we are creating uh, gangs. We are funding them. That's the money they get to buy the guns to create this violence. This is one of the worst policies we've ever been through. And we will see it, whether it's today, tomorrow, or 50 years from now, we will see that this is one of the worst policies. We need to legalize it, and we need to stand up to Trump. Illinois needs to have some courage and legalize this right now. Well, as you can tell from the pause, it doesn't take much courage at this point. I think there's a wide, widespread agreement uh, in Illinois regarding legalization. Uh, I'm concerned, I will say though, as somebody who's sort of out from the outside looking in at Springfield, that I'm concerned about how that law would look because I saw in the medicinal marijuana process that there's a lot of insider and cronyism in terms of licensing and things like that, and I'm concerned about how that will turn out. So I agree that it should be legalized, but it needs to be legalized in a way that does not benefit politicians and line their own pockets, okay? So that's the first thing. Um, second of all, though, I do think that, the, that our job on that has gotten much more difficult. Everyone up here may say, oh sure, I'll work for legalization, but unfortunately, Attorney General Jeff Sessions has decided that you know, his number one priority, in addition to deporting people that Trump doesn't like, uh, is prosecuting people for marijuana offenses, and has made that um, a recent, uh, you know, has recently come out and talked about that, and unfortunately repealed Obama-era guidance that made, that gave some safety to people who are operating legally within the state. So it creates a complication for us, because we legalize marijuana, and there could be businesses here, and then we have the Jeff Sessions Justice Department coming in and arresting people who've invested in a grow facility, or in a distribution center. So this just shows us, I think, the importance of taking action against the uh, against the Trump administration and, and doing that legally to tie them up as much as possible in terms of the form of their of their rulemaking, so that we can give space for those industries to grow. This uh, marijuana, I actually signed the bill to legalize medical marijuana. Uh, Twenty nine states across the country, many of them red states, Republican states have legalized medical marijuana, eight states have re legalized recreational marijuana. There's a referendum on the Cook County ballot that uh, I hope people come out and vote uh, yes in favor of uh, getting a law passed in Illinois. Uh, truthfully, recreational marijuana across the country has only happened in states where a referendum made it happen. Again, the power of people voting on issues We've got to see that in Illinois as a key way of reforming a lot of things, raising the minimum wage, getting stronger ethics laws, ending the drug war that uh, Aaron talked about. Uh, I did, as I said a moment ago, many clemencies for those who were convicted of drug crimes. They perhaps uh, did things wrong when they were kids or younger people, uh, but they changed their, their life, and oftentimes they were unfairly punished. So. It's important to have uh, sentencing reform uh, with respect to any kind of legalization process. That's called reparative justice, and we've got to have that in our state, and the Attorney General can be a leader in getting that kind of reform passed. Uh, so this is a real good issue, I think, that connects the public to the importance of being able to have the people speak, not just the politicians in Springfield. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's important to know that um, when you take on things in the legislature, oftentimes they happen incrementally, and that's because of politics. That's because you have rep, uh, representative democracy, you have people from all regions who, some who are more conservative than others, and it's difficult to move them along to a place where they accept. I, I, I agree exactly with uh, what both uh, Aaron and uh, Renato expressed. One, with regards to the fact of uh, marijuana as juxtaposed against alcohol. Alcohol can be a lot more harmful than uh, marijuana use. Uh, we embrace medicinal use of medicinal uh, marijuana. I supported that. Uh, we embrace decriminalization. Uh, and we have got to move to legalization with regulation, of course. You know, some strains of marijuana today are not your granddaddy's uh, marijuana. <laughs> so we have to know what we're we're doing. I've heard of people going to Denver and locking themselves in the hotel room after they ate a brownie. Um, so we, got to, we do have to be careful. But uh, we do have to work retroactively to deal with uh, what we've done in terms of punishing people who should not be uh, incar incarcerated. Uh, 
Um, so I agree that it's time to legalize marijuana. I do think we need to have regulations that are similar to those that we've imposed on cigarettes and alcohol in terms of age and the types of uh, products that are being provided to our community. Um, I think it's important to note that 88% of drug arrests nationally between 2001 and 2010 were for possession of personal use quantities of marijuana. 88%. That's a lot of people getting arrested. That's a lot of people being incarcerated. And we know that those incarcerations disproportionately impact our communities of color. So I think it's important to decriminalize marijuana uh, for those reasons as well. And then as far as Jeff Sessions is concerned, as Attorney General, I will absolutely stand up to this ridiculous attempt to roll back protections for medicinal use and frankly think that medicinal use should be legal federally. If you think about it, if you have a child with epilepsy, if you have a parent with Parkinson's, if you're dealing with cancer, you should be able to go to Walgreens and get your medication. You shouldn't have to take a handful of cash and go meet with somebody off the highway because that's where you can go get your medicinal marijuana. So I think it's a real opportunity to move us forward, to recognize the reality of the use, and do it in a way that keeps people safe. Concur. Uh, we, we, need to, <laughs> we need to legalize it, and but we need to regulate it accordingly, like we regulate you know, cigarettes and, and, and alcohol. Uh, and frankly, we need to tax it because uh, the one benefit to Colorado is, and we do still have a massive pension de uh, deficit in the state. You know, it's a form of uh, revenue that will help us address some of those other fiscal issues uh, as well, as well as you know, uh, restorative justice for folks who you know shouldn't be there. Our prison population, 80 percent, about 80 percent of those are folks who didn't graduate high school. You know, and I would much rather spend. Uh, about thirteen thousand dollars a year on P to twenty, than spending you know upwards of forty thousand dollars a year on fifteen to twenty for ridiculous crimes, and so that's how we should be allocating our resources and the uh, sessions goofiness of, of retracting what was sensible guidance. You already have the Republican U.S. Attorney in Colorado saying, "I'm not going to change anything I'm doing." Uh, so you know he's telling his boss. Go shove it, because it's ridiculous. <laughs> and so thank goodness our U.S. attorneys come from our communities, and even our current new, new uh, U.S. attorney, uh, Losh, here in Illinois, I, I don't think he will change how he does uh, his, his job, and hopefully won't change his prosecutorial discretion and, and just good sense. A couple years ago, I was proud to uh, be selected to be one of the only members of the uh, Illinois General Assembly in the House uh, to sit on the uh, Commission on uh, uh, Criminal Justice and Sentencing Reform, the goal which was to reduce the prison population by 25% by 2025. A big part of the discussion was the war on drugs and, and drug sentencing, and I won't get into it. I, I agree that Illinois is moving in the direction uh, of legalizing marijuana, but I want to make sure that we do it in a responsible way. As, as a dad of, of a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old, uh, the prevalence of uh, discussion about marijuana in high school and in middle school, uh, kids think that if it's legalized, it's going to be legalized for 15-year-olds and 12-year-olds. Uh, and there are so many studies that show that while it may not have a big impact on a fully developed brain, uh, when you're talking about a child, uh, it can have some serious long-term impacts. And I want to make sure that we go about implementing it in the proper way. And I, I believe everybody here agrees with that sentiment. The other thing that we need to talk about uh, from, with respect to this issue is how does it actually work? Because one of the biggest impediments to the trade uh, to legalizing marijuana is the fact that no federal bank is allowed to take any of the revenue. Uh, because they can't get federal insurance. So as Attorney General, I think the Attorney General across the country need to band together and talk about this issue because what you're having, and I, uh, in Oregon I was there right after they legalized it, you have people on, on tax payment day with, with satchels of cash all going to the Capitol to pay their taxes and certainly that is not uh, what we want. So we need to go about this in a responsible way and make sure that it's done in a way that's going to keep everybody safe. So I, I agree that, that that uh, what, it, what has been said, that this issue is really important. We know that, that, that our community really believes that this is the way the law should be going. And then also that the, the criminalization of marijuana really has a, this disproportionate effect on communities of color. So this is just another way that our criminal justice system has 
just and not working for us. So we definitely need to go down this path. But as has been said, we need to be careful about it. We, do, we, need, we definitely need to regulate it. We need to make sure that we can do it in a way where we can keep our communities safe, whether it's from driving under the influence or whether it's uh, pre preventing young people, as Scott has said, from, from using marijuana inappropriately. With regard to pushing back on the Sessions administration, again, we need to make sure that what we have going on here in Illinois is is legal, the legal strength that we create is being implemented in a, in a safe and effective way. And with that, we can use our legal structure to push back against the Sessions um, Department of Justice activity and hopefully, again, work with the, the U.S. Attorney to prevent, um, to, to discourage him from following Sessions' direction. And then, dealing with the folks who have already been convicted of marijuana crimes, this is just a big part of dealing with over-incarceration issue that we have here in Illinois. So I would make that part of our broader strategy of dealing with the over-incarceration over issue that we have. And so th these are definitely things that the Attorney General has the opportunity to work on, and I look forward to it. Thank you. So thank you. That was our last question. I would like to start with Governor Quinn with a one-minute closing statement. <laughs> I've represented more clients, I think, than anybody who's running for this office. Everyday people. I've never represented uh, in a big corporate law firm. That isn't what I do. I represent people against uh, unfair utility rates or unfair property tax assessments or unfairness with respect to our voting. These are the fundamental rights that everybody has. And I think it's important to have an attorney general who has a record, who has won great victories for everyday people in terms of not only court victories, but passing laws. When we ended the death penalty, when we passed marriage equality, you have to understand that the law is the way we change our culture and change behavior and conduct. So you have to have a strong voice as Attorney General, especially against what Trump, with his racist and hateful, vile conduct. Uh, there has to be somebody from Illinois that uses the law to take him out. Folks, uh, this evening, I think, you know, we have a, a good group of, of well-qualified people lending themselves to this journey and uh, notwithstanding the fact that I hope that I'm the one, I, I appreciate spending <laughs> a lot of time with these folks. Uh, I want to repeat, I appreciate the last 15 years that uh, Lisa Madigan has served. Uh, I've worked along with her on a lot of fronts uh, and there's some things that uh, I would continue but again I think we need uh, to expand the voice of the Attorney General to advocate for criminal justice reform as I have been for a long time. Uh, we need to make sure that the Public Access Council within the Attorney General's office that I sponsored the legislation to create is appropriately resourced so there's not a backlog of FOIA requests in the Attorney General's office. Well, thank you, I see my time and I want to <laughs> respect it. But I just want to say thank you to all of you all for putting this together. So I think we've established tonight that the Attorney General's seat is a very important seat, and we need to win in November. There's just no question, and the front runner to run against any of us is uh, anti-choice, anti-marriage equality, pro-Trump. That's not who we need to have our, be our Attorney General in Illinois. We've got a strong tradition of standing up for civil rights and human rights, and we need to have somebody who fully values and understands those rights and will join with other states, attorneys general, to stand up against Trump on behalf of all of the people of Illinois. I have a background in business and law. I bring to you experience in the executive office. I'm a proud member of the Board of Planned Parenthood, and I'm pleased to share with you this evening, I have the endorsements of Jan Schakowsky and Julie Hamas and Laura Fine, women that I think many in this room admire. So thank you for the chance to join you tonight. Thank you now at ABT. I look forward to talking with all of you in the months to come and would love your support. I'm Nancy Rotary, running for Attorney General. Thank you all for uh, being here and allowing us to, to uh, speak with you all today about why we want to be Attorney General. And uh, you'll know, if you did know, a lot of us are fairly similar. That's a great thing about Democrats uh, on the issues. So how are you going to distinguish amongst us? And, and looking to our commitment to service. Looking, what my mom and dad would always say is like, what did you do when nobody was looking? When nobody was going to give you a pat on the back? When it wasn't your job to do it? And I worked on community policing. I started Little League teams. I started the Kensington Area Neighborhood Organization. I taught junior achievement at Wendell Smith Elementary School. I did a peer retention program at Bowen High School. 
This is when I was a guy right out of undergrad, seeing the need in our community and stepping up and doing something and nobody appointed me to do it because I'm a citizen and it's my job to serve my community. I'm a fortunate uh, son of immigrants. And so I look forward to being the first Mexican-American Attorney General. And if you think Judge Gonzalo Curiel bothered Donald Trump, <laughs> wait till you think that Jesse Bento who he sues him. <laughs> this primary, we have the opportunity for the first time in 15 years to, to make a determination. Do we want an attorney general who will have core democratic values and be completely independent in decision making and not take orders from the machine? Or do we want an attorney general who's just going to follow and do what they're told? I represent the former. I have a history of standing up for the public. I have a history of standing up to my own party when we need to. And I have a history of standing up to Governor Rauner and I'll stand up to Donald Trump. No one needs to question that because I've done it. No one needs to say, are these just words? Is he going to have the courage to do this? I've stood up to the most powerful politician in the state of Illinois because it was the right thing to do, and because a majority of the people in Illinois think that's the right thing to do, yet nobody does it because they're scared. I come to you with a background as a litigator, as a, a member of the federal trial bar, as a lawyer for the last 20 years. I'm running for attorney general to clean up Illinois and return our state to you. Is, in this race, I not only want to earn your vote, but I want to earn your trust. Thank you, I'm Scott Burry. So, for the past few days, I've really been struggling with the whole S-hole comment, right? It's really, it really got me down. And I've been thinking about, you know, this, this dichotomy that, that exists in our political culture. Because part of what bothered me was not only the comment, but the acceptance by the Republicans and the people on that side. And I kept thinking to myself, what can we do? What can we do as progressive Democrats to fight back against that? And what I believe we need to do is we need to get our own house in order. We need to have a government. We need to prove that when we govern as Democrats, we do it in a thoughtful and effective way, in a way that serves the citizens and not our political leaders. And we need an attorney general and help deliver that for us. I believe that I can be that kind of attorney general, and that's why I'm here. Thank you for having us. I agree with Mr. Ruiz. The question is, what are you doing when no one's patting on the back? What are you doing when no one's looking? I represent poor people. Every single day I go into court, no one's patting me on the back. The judge hates my clients, the prosecutors hate my clients, but I stand up next to them every single day. So when you want to know when an issue comes before me as Attorney General, how am I going to deal with it? I'm going to put the people first. When you stand up with poor people, when you stand up for everyday Illinoisans, that's what you know about. And Troy LaRavier agrees, and that's why he's endorsing me. Northside Democracy for America, they agree, and that's why they're endorsing me. And progressive groups throughout the state agree with me. So I'm asking you to agree with me. Hopefully, I can earn your support. Hopefully, I can be your next attorney general. So if you couldn't tell by the way I talk, I'm a little different than everyone else up here. I'm not. Everyone else up here is an elected official, or they've been appointed by Ron to something. I'm not either of those things. I am somebody who spent my life investigating crime, trying cases, litigating cases, the kind of experience that I think an attorney general needs. Um, and I haven't, you know, I haven't gotten involved in the political process. So I'm running my campaign differently than a lot of the campaigns up here. I'm not giving hundreds of thousands of dollars to my own campaign. I'm not financing it through checks from whether it's big tobacco or utilities or spe other types of special interests. I have thousands of individual contributors. Almost all of them are under $100 um, or more, you know, $100. Uh, and almost all of them are individuals. It's a different kind of campaign. I have tens of thousands of people who've signed up to volunteer. We're trying to make 500,000 phone calls before Election Day. It's a grassroots campaign, campaign and I hope you join us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it. <laughs> Thank you.